The topic for today's episode is deciding where to live in retirement. And my guest is fellow retirement coach and author, Susan Ackley. She resides in the Chicago area. Susan and I both wrote chapters in the book, The Retirement Challenge, a non-financial guide from top retirement experts. And Susan wrote a chapter in the book by the same topic as today's episode. You can learn more about Susan and her retirement coaching on her website, which is compasspointllc.org. I will include a link to the website in the transcript. So welcome, Susan. I look forward to discussing this topic with you, and you and I have spoken about this topic in the past, and we both think it's really a really important one for people as they transition into retirement. Well, thank you, Reed. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's good yeah. to see you. Good to see yeah. you. Yeah, and again, I, I think it's such a great topic to talk about and discuss, and, and I really enjoyed your topic in the book. More and more people, I think, as they transition into retire, retirement, and I really think it starts with a lot of the baby boomers, is mm -hmm. we, we're much more, we've, we've traveled abroad, we've lived abroad, we've moved to different states, we, mm -hmm. we're, we're just much more mobile than previous generations, and I think with that what that ultimately lends itself to is when we get to retirement, we, we think about traveling or living in these other places, places, again, we've visited, we've lived in previously. Mm -hmm. You and I both live in northern climates, you in Chicago, myself yeah. in Minneapolis, and we know a lot of people who are snowbirds who go live down south for much of the year, uh, but we still enjoy the area up here. A lot of People have kids who move to different areas. Right. So they perhaps follow their kids. So there's just a lot of things to think about when when um, thinking about deciding where to live in retirement. So one yes. of the things that I one of the things I really liked about your chapter, Susan, was that you created it in such a way as it was like a plan. You you list a lot of questions and a lot of things that we all have to think about when making this decision. So I really like that. And your chapter begins by offering two starting points to help people decide where to live in retirement. And the two starting points are taking the time to look at and be aware of the myriad of options. And then mm -hmm. secondly, to know yourself and what you want. So the first question I wanted to pose to you is why is it so important for people to take the time to look at and be aware of the myriad of options available to us when deciding where to live in retirement. Well, not every everywhere offers the same things that other places offer. So for instance, uh, in the United States, we pretty much offer convenience. You can you know, get your Amazon package delivered. That seems to be a big topic. Your Amazon package delivered to you in a relatively short period of time. Uh, if, if you live so in another country, that is a much more difficult thing to do. So convenience is an option here. And some people tolerate that better than others. It's, it's le about learning the things that are available in that location. Now, most many people travel to an area for the weather. And of course, we in the upper Midwest, we have our own issues to deal with here, but the summer times are beautiful, winters are not so much. So you, you just have to know what you want, what you like, what you don't like. If you can't handle temperatures that are in the 100 plus degrees in the summertime, then it's not, you're not gonna move to the desert. Uh, if you can't, if, if you need for a health reason to live somewhere warm and dry, then the desert would be a good option for you. So it's just what your needs are, what's available, what you can tolerate, and that's all about knowing yourself really well and what you want and what you need. Yeah, and I think that's interesting that you mentioned convenience because that's one thing that I, I don't think a lot of people think about. They think about the weather and they think about the amenities and things like that, but just the simple things like you know getting a package delivered or having restaurants close or whatever it is, we're so used to having everything at our fingertips here and it's not like that in a lot of either rural places in the United States or places particularly outside of outside of the country. Yes and language is another issue if you choose to move to let's say Spain or you move to Central 
America, language may be an issue and it may be, may be a barrier. It may be a barrier that, that you may not be able to overcome easily or shortly. So those are all things to consider. So knowing yourself and what you want seems relatively straightforward, I think, to a lot of people. But, yeah. but explain that a little bit more and, and maybe where do you see people running into trouble if they don't know themselves and what they want? Okay, well, making a snap decision or an impulsive decision it doesn't really work very well because then there's this repent and leisure type thing. Some people may be pleasantly surprised what they get, but if you don't know yourself, if you don't know what you can tolerate easily and well, if you have to have HBO everywhere you go and Wi-Fi is a limited option, then guess what? You're not going to be very happy. Um, the, other, the other piece of knowing yourself is if you have a spouse or a partner, uh, if you are both not on the same page and both know what you want and are able to negotiate that, uh, that can become a big issue in both your marriage and, and where you're going to live. And what I've seen happen is that sometimes people just end up not moving at all. They just stay exactly where they are. Even though, even though they have this desire to move somewhere else, they just can't either come to an agreement or they can't decide. Because there are so many options. So the better you know yourself, the better you can sift through the myriad of options that are available in the world of where you want to live. I mean, the world is really our oyster these days, so we can virtually live anywhere uh, as long as we can overcome the hurdles of if there's immigration or money or other uh, other things that may impede our ability to live in that place. And I think that's a key point that you mentioned too, Susan, was being on the same page with your spouse because yeah. we each, I think, potentially have different visions of what this time looks like and where we want to live. And so mm -hmm. it really takes I, working through a lot of those questions that you have in your in your chapter, in your book, in the book, and mm -hmm. making sure that you're both on the same page. Yes. In the book, I talk about a couple, uh, Matt and Janny, and at, at the start, when they first sat in front of me, or when we first talked, uh, they were definitely not on the same page. They had definite different ideas of what they wanted to do with their retirement and where they wanted to live. So uh, if you read the book, you, you'll read the story of Matt and Janie. Of course, that story is still ongoing. It's, it's not resolved yet, and it may not be resolved for years to come because they're, they are younger retirees, but they're in a place and exploring. So, And that's interesting that you talk about Matt and Janie because that was actually my next question I wanted to pose to you. You, you include this interesting story about them and they had trouble deciding where to, ret where to retire. So give us just a little bit of the, the background story of Matt and Janie and um, how you help them sort out their options. We won't get into, again, the, their entire story, but let's at least kind of look at the beginning of where they were at and how you helped them sort out their options. Okay. Well, um, Matt retired. He was a little bit older than Janny, and he retired in his mid-50s. And Janny was going to retire in the near future. This is at the beginning of our relationship, our coaching. And uh, Matt had wanted to move to Florida, and that was it. That's what he wanted. And Janny, they had two uh, adult, young adult children, and one of their son was uh, floundering a little bit. So Janny, they had traveled to Panama, had seen Panama at one point and decided that Janny had decided this, Matt had decided this, mm -hmm. that that would be the perfect location for them to move. They could start a water sports business, which their son could then be involved in. Of course, she didn't talk to their son about this at all, but she just had this idea in her head about what it would look like and what it would be like and how wonderful it would be that they would all be together in a warm climate. Because they did, they did know that they, they knew they wanted to move somewhere warm or at least be in a warm climate in the winter. So when we first started, we had to sort of chink away at a lot of their preconceived ideas of what they thought they wanted and essentially what they really had to do was do a lot of research on what they 
where they wanted, what they wanted to do, where they wanted to go, what they saw as their future, because they both had very different ideas. And that's, that was a problem. So we had some pretty tense moments, but it ended up working out. They uh, downsized from the big house that they were in their family home and they just started traveling. And that's essentially what they're doing now is researching what's out there, what's not. Now, Matt, for himself, they bought a place in Florida, a condo that they could go uh, stay in the wintertime that had some of the activities that Janny liked and some of the activities that Matt liked, which is golf. So, so one of the things that's, that I think is working for them, it sounds like, is as they travel to these different locations, that is part of their research to figure out which location really ultimately is the best location for them. Yes. So when they, they travel somewhere, they try to, tr to, tr to stay in that location for two to four weeks, a minimum, and try to live like, live like they live there. So they go to the, they have a place that had, they don't go to a hotel. They usually do a, an Airbnb or a VRBO or rent something if that's available. And they, they cook their meals. They go to the grocery store. They try to meet the people around them. They see what activities are available. And that's what I advise other people to do if they're looking for somewhere to try out, you know, try out what will work for them and what won't. Yep, give it a so. test drive, right? Yes, exactly. Now, some people may have already done that. They, have, they may have already spent a lot of time in an area. They may, what I've been seeing lately is people who went to an area when they were children uh, they went to a lake or whatever, and many of them are moving back because they remember that they remember they know what it's like. They know how con how convenient it is, and the the culture, essentially the culture of where that location is. Now, of course, many places have had some major development, but this is something that they can get around. Yep, that's interesting. Yeah. So with, with so many choices, considerations, and factors mm -hmm. for people to think about, give us just a few, maybe some of the more important ones so people can get an idea of the many facets of deciding where to live in retirement. Well, I'll speak, I'll speak from my own experience. I mean, I've, I haven't, I'm still searching for somewhere to go, but weather is a factor. Okay. Yep. I, I will probably continue to have a hybrid location because I like I like being here. I have family and friends where I am locally near Chicago and I don't like the weather in the winter, but so I would probably have a hybrid. Um, of course, maybe down the road in the future, I may decide, hey, I'm just gonna pick up and move to the Canary Islands. Let's just say the Canary Islands. And uh, if I did decide to do that, immigration would be a big thing that I'd have to look at. How I can stay in that location. If it's an interna in international location, how would I stay in that location legally uh, with all of the benefits? How would I get my social security, how, my checks? How would I take money out? I mean, money is a factor as well. So it seems like we talk about one topic and we quickly move to another. So we talk about immigration. Now, how do we get our money? How do we do this? Is banking easy? How do people come to visit me? Do I rent? Do I buy? It's, it's just opens up like a can of worms. That uh, Yeah, and I think that's one thing too that you mentioned in your book is as people are working through these different decisions, one decision leads into a different set of questions and decisions, which leads into follow-up decisions, just like you were mentioning in your examples. And I, I think that's, that's what makes this decision really challenging, is those, those issues that you're mentioning that people don't, haven't thought of a lot of times, especially, in, especially when moving internationally. Yes, yes. Well, even state to state. I mean, if you're going to move to a state that... Uh, it has a very high income uh, state income tax. Yep. Then I mean that also is a factor that you have to think about. If the sales tax is twelve percent and you've been in a state where you're paying two percent, that's a big 
chunk that that out of your out of your budget your monthly budget so you know I, I don't usually talk about money because I'm a non-financial retirement coach but in this regard you really have to think about money some people think if they move to uh, Central America well it's just going to be so cheap but that's really not the reality I mean it could cost you what it costs you and the decisions that you make affect that bottom line yeah yeah good points good points so one another section of your chapter you talk about some of the do's and don'ts to consider mm -hmm. when making the decision so give us some of the do's and some of the don'ts that people need need to think about maybe some of them that they haven't given much thought to some of them that pop up that we aren't as familiar with okay um well I did just talk about one of them and that's banking. So if you move somewhere, it, let's say you're a snowbird and you, you decide you're going to spend part of your time where you live in the situation that I talked about, the hybrid situation. Is your bank, do they have a branch there? Are you, you can do things, many things online if your Wi-Fi is fine, but that can just create some big problems that you don't want to encounter. How do I get money? I mean, it's a, that can cause feelings of desperation. But the other, the other piece is immigration. And is there an embassy? And if you're moving internationally, is there an embassy that you can go to? It's, it's even just silly things like if you move to this location, let's say it's in the United States, are you able to keep your car there for a lengthy period of time registered in the state that you're from? Or do you have to change the registration? Or do you leave your car at home and you buy another car? It's just, I mean, I know those may seem like very small minor decisions, but in the grand scheme of things, it's just adds up to, it, it can add up to a, some despair and some chaos and, uh, you know, just throwing your hands up, I'm not doing this right so it's like it's like when you you build a house or remodel a house you have so many decisions to make in that moment and what you what you want to have happen may not be able to happen based upon the decisions that you the, the decisions that you make so if you want a, a bathroom that has a, a chrome faucet you have to buy a chrome faucet but do you buy a, a single handle faucet or do you buy a double handle faucet? I know I'm getting off on a different tangent, but it is a similar type thing. It's just so many decisions that have to be made and they, they build on top of each other. Yep. So I'm not sure I quite answered that question about the do's and don'ts, but immigration is, is a big one if it's, uh, if it's internationally. Do they allow retirees? because there are some communities that do. Panama and Costa Rica have uh, retiree visas. I think Spain also, parts of the EU also do as well. But the mm. EU is a big, of course, the, the value of the euro is higher than the value of the dollar. So it may end up costing you more money. But what's the cost of living in the location where you're going, of thinking of going? Is it something you can manage? So. Um, Good. Yeah. Yes. So read they, the book. <laughs> yes, exactly. That that's just what I was going <laughs> to the suggest. Book. There's a long. <laughs> I think you have quite a list of do's and don'ts in there, along with a whole long list of questions to work through. Which we again we, we don't have time to cover all of those, and yeah. I think the best yeah. way to do that is to either read the chapter or to contact Susan for more information. So. Before we end our conversation today, Susan, is there anything you'd like to mention either about the chapter, anything I didn't ask about, or is there something else you'd want to share with the audience about deciding where to live in retirement? Well, I will uh, just give a, a, a minor tip. Um, I have recently become aware of a real estate sort of designation that is called a senior re real estate specialist. And the biggest thing is they are trained, this, this group of real estate people, <laughs> excuse me, are trained to work with people in transition, particularly seniors. They are very well versed on the needs of, of seniors and people in retirement. 
So I have recently been working with a couple of people who real estate, these SRES real estate brokers who have been so helpful and in, in terms of the transition, in terms of helping people stage their homes, in terms of helping people find something that is appropriate for where they want to live and asking many of the questions that I might as a coach might ask except from a real estate perspective. So uh, if that's a possibility of finding someone who is in a designation as senior real estate specialist that might be a really good option for someone who's looking to downsize. The other thing is I am working on another a book, a chapter in another book about what to do with all the stuff. So now you've decided where you want to live. Where do you put all the stuff that you have? A, a lifetime of things. So um, that's, I guess, the other other thing to think of is what do you do with uh, grandma's thimble collection or what, whatever it may be. Um, so that's... Yeah, that that's a good topic for a future episode, I think, Susan, because that, that's the other part of it is if you want to move where you move to, you might, you, you probably don't need all of your stuff. And so you need to downsize. You need to, a lot of people move from a very large home to a smaller home. Of course, mm -hmm. they don't have room for all of their things. So what, what do you do with those? Which ones are the most important? Which ones do you keep? Right. Which ones do you give away? Which ones do you put into storage? There's all kinds of decisions that that come up around that topic too so yes that's almost it. as many as with deciding where to live in retirement yeah we do with all my stuff anyway, yeah thank you thank you Reed, very much absolutely so thank you susan for joining me today i'm yes. glad you could share uh, your chapter with us on deciding where to live in retirement i'm sure it's a topic again that we could explore much more hopefully in a future episode we'll we'll get to touch on it again Thank you, Reed, very much. Yep. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time.